I'd like to think with you for a few minutes this afternoon about Christian citizenship. We are blessed to be part of a nation that to this point has provided for us a ability to worship the Lord as we understand from his word he should be worshiped. This celebration of independence, this declaration of independence in 1776 was uh, in, in one sense a testimony to the desire of those who would be able to worship the Lord in a way in which they believed would honor him. And under the oppression of King George III, uh, those uh, beginning families and individuals um, declared or celebrated a, um, a declaration of independence from his rule, the monarch of Britain at that time. I've often thought about the details of that and the parts and pieces of that. And one thing that I am committed to is not as a pastor to find myself trying to wed together some kind of God and country idea. I believe the best thing for us to do is to look into the word of God to see how we can be the citizens that God would have us to be. And if you have any question about that, just think about Jesus Christ and about the apostle Paul and how in their ministry, they did not move in that direction whatsoever. They didn't take stances on slavery. They didn't take stances on patriotic things. What they did was uh, instructed believers how we're supposed to live in the place where God has us. There were no Christian governments in Paul's day. None. So when Paul gave his instruction, he didn't have in mind the United States of America and the demanding of rights that the constituents might have. He just told you what God wanted. Uh, Jesus in his day was asked straightforward questions, not only in regards to the government over them, but also to the temple tax. And you know what his answers were, but I think we'd be reminded of those. It'll help us keep these things in front of us and just uh, think together about our responsibilities as Christians and citizens of not only this country, but any country. What would that look like? Uh, it, it's it's really very clear that many Christians in this society have no concept or even thought about a Christianity that's not American. That's a problem. The Bible wasn't written to Americans and the Bible was written to believers everywhere. And so it's really hard for us to rein ourselves in away from concepts and ideas that we've been brought up with that are foreign to the scriptures. They're not there. And so if we're truly those that would desire to be scriptural and biblical, we have to separate this back out and say, let's just look at what God has for us. And let's make sure that we as individuals are conscious of these things and reflecting these things because God has spoken to these things. He has spoken to these things. So I have three reminders for you this afternoon, things that you know, and that's why I'm calling them reminders or reference points, we might say, for God honoring citizenship. The first is simply this. God is ruler over all. Okay. God is ruler over all. And so I ask you to turn to Daniel, Daniel chapter number four. Three reminders or reference points for God honoring citizenship. First is this, God is ruler over all. He's the creator and sustainer of all of life, of everything that exists. And he's the Lord and ruler or regulator of all of life. He's the judge, he's the redeemer of all calling men to faith. He's the father, he's the shepherd to all who will believe him and trust him and obey him. God is the ruler over all. Daniel chapter number four and verse number 17. Four seventeen. you know the story, the situation down in chapter four is Nebuchadnezzar's visions. And down in verse number 17, we hear this statement. This matter is by the decree of the watchers and the demand of by the word of the holy ones to the intent that the living may know that the most high ruleth in the kingdom of men and giveth it to whomsoever he will and setteth up over it 
the basis, basest of men. The Most High ruleth in the kingdom of men, giveth it to whomsoever he will, and setteth up over it the basest of men. Down in verse number 25 of the same text, Deuteronomy 4, I'm Deuteronomy, Daniel 4 and verse 25. That they shall drive thee from men, and thy dwelling shall be with the beast of the field, and they shall make thee to eat grass as oxen, and they shall wet thee with the dew of heaven, and seven times shall pass over thee, till thou know that the Most High ruleth in the kingdom of men, and giveth it to whomsoever he will. God is letting Nebuchadnezzar know through this vision, through this dream, the reality that he is the most high God and that he rules over the kingdom of men and he gives it to whomsoever he will. Verse number 32. Verse 32. And they shall drive thee from men and thy dwelling shall be with the beast of the field. They shall make thee to eat grass as oxen and seven... Uh, times shall pass over thee until thou know that the Most High ruleth in the kingdom of men and giveth it to whomsoever he will. God is the ruler over all. Turn back for just a moment to Proverbs chapter number 8. Proverbs chapter 8. There are more of these. Is the only two that we're looking to this afternoon. Proverbs chapter 8 and just two verses here. And Proverbs are succinct statements that state principles or truths in a very brief fashion that uh, grant us a reference point for various situations in life, grant us wisdom, grant us insight. Uh, this is a statement by wisdom, wisdom being everlasting, wisdom here, a personification, a testimony of the rule of God. And down in verse number 15 of Proverbs chapter 8, after unfolding this, we get to verse 15 and it says, By me, that is by this wisdom, wisdom uh, uh, originating with God, by me kings reign and princes decree justice, by me princes rule and nobles, even all the judges of the earth. So fundamentally, we settle our hearts into the reality that there is a king, there is a ruler over all. That doesn't mean God's approving of everything that's happening. But when we watch Israel and we watch God deal with Israel, we recognize God is ruling over everything. And even those that uh, were, were less righteous, more evil than Israel. That's kind of an unbelievable thing, wasn't it, that the prophet saw in Habakkuk? You, you are going to, with a people more wicked than your people, Israel, bring judgment to Israel. Yes, that's what I'm going to do. And I'm going to do that because that's the way I will advance my purposes in that particular case in point. So I, I would just suggest to you and ask you to think about this. When we, uh, issue, when we have issues with authorities in our life, every struggle with authority begins with God. What do you mean? I mean, it begins with a struggle with God because God put the authorities in our lives. God, God established these things. And you know what the New Testament is going to say about that because it's going to have us honoring them and praying for them. And it's not going to come with qualifiers. It's not going to say pray for the ones you like and say harsh and other things about those you don't like. I, I wonder how many Christians pray for the government authorities that are over them versus how many Christians talk about their dislike and their dissatisfaction and almost an intolerance to those that God has allowed to serve those places. So God is the ruler over all. Secondly, Jesus is the perfect image bearer. You say that's, that's an obvious thing. We know that. I know that, but I say that to you again this afternoon because if we're going to talk about the Christian citizenship, we're going to start with Jesus because Jesus is the only perfect, right? He's the only perfect image bearer. So not only is God the ruler over all, but Jesus is the perfect image bearer. If, if we say, what does likeness to God look like? Well, we're going to have to come to the person of Jesus Christ. So turn to Matthew 22. This particular passage is, uh, is, is mentioned in Mark 12 and Luke 20 as well. 
So all the synoptics include this record. Matthew chapter number 22. About halfway through, we get to uh, verse 15. Verse 15 of Matthew 22. Again, this story is repeated three times in the New Testament. So if we're reading through the New Testament, we'll catch this again and again. And it gives us Jesus' view of authorities. In verse number 15, it says, Then went the Pharisees and took counsel, and we're seeing what they're doing here again, how they might entangle him in his talk. And that's, that's what they spent their time doing. And they sent out unto him their disciples with the Herodians, saying, Master... Listen to how they phrase this. We know that thou art true and teachest the way of God in truth. Neither carest thou for any man, for thou regardest not the person of men. Tell us, therefore, what thinkest thou? Is it lawful to give tribute unto Caesar or not? But Jesus perceived their wickedness and said, Why tempt ye me, ye hypocrites? Show me the tribute money. And they brought unto him a penny. And he saith unto them, Who, whose is this image and superscription? Well, they say unto him, Caesar's. Then saith he unto them, Render therefore unto Caesar the things which are Caesar's, and unto God the things that are God's. It says, When they had heard these words, they marveled and left him and went their way. <laughs> Not only was Jesus Christ the master teacher, he was the master question answerer, wasn't he? Like, how many different directions could he go? How eloquent could he wax? And all, he said, you know, bring me one of those. Whose picture's on that? Pay your taxes. Don't you love that simplicity? It's like, where's, where's all the, there's nothing there. There's no qualifiers there. It just says, here it is. And this is what you're to do. Matthew 17, back the other way, a few chapters. Matthew 17. Render unto Caesar what is Caesar's without any qualifier. Matthew 17 and verse number 24. Now this would be, uh, this tribute money is a, a temple tax. Um, verse 24, Matthew 17. And when they were come to Capernaum, they that received tribute money came to Peter and said, Doth not your master pay tribute? He said, Yes. And when he's coming to the house, Jesus prevented him saying, what thinkest thou, Simon, of whom do the kings of the earth take custom or tribute of their own children or of strangers? Understanding of that is of their own sons. And in this case, God, Jesus would be the son, right? The son of God. And Peter saith unto him of strangers, Jesus saith, then are the children free notwithstanding, verse 27, lest we should offend them, go thou to the sea and cast a hook and take up the fish that first cometh up. And when thou hast opened his mouth, thou shalt find a piece of money that take and give unto them for me and for thee. So as Lord of all, he submitted to human authorities, in this case, even the temple authorities, and he participated in no rebel calls against them. And the question was raised and he answered in a very direct and um, uh, final way as the one who perfectly understood and reflected the father's will. He said, here's what you do in Caesar's case. Here's what you do in regards to the temple tax. So the son of God paid the temple tax. God is ruler over all. Jesus is the perfect image bearer. Jesus made it very clear he was no political Messiah. And then thirdly, the apostles give us the Lord's mind. Three reminders are reference points for God honoring citizenship. And God is the ruler over all. Jesus is the perfect image bearer. And the apostles give us the Lord's mind. We have three passages here that begins in Romans chapter number 13. And I will share with you in Sunday school this morning that we 
need to make sure that when we go to the scriptures, we are grasping what God intended to say. And sometimes I find myself listening to rationale and things from Romans 13 and other places that seem very tainted with more what we think we want to hear than what God actually said. So let me just encourage you again. Uh, take, take up the word of God and just hear what's said here. And this is Paul living in a pagan society where there were no Christian governors. There were no Christian rulers. In fact, they were those who were in opposition to the gospel and opposition to Christ. Um, there's no need to go into all the details of what it looked like in that day, but it was uh, rather uh, an in-your-face evil that was taking place from the top down. And Paul speaks to this in verse 1 of Romans 13, let every soul, pretty sweeping way to say it, every soul be subject unto the higher powers. He wants to substantiate that for there is no power, there's no one in those authority places, but of God, the powers that be, they are ordained of God. There's only one who can put those authorities there and that's God and the powers that are there have been ordained by God. Whosoever therefore resisteth the power, resisteth the ordinance of God. And they that resist shall receive to themselves damnation. For rulers are not a terror to good works, but to the evil. Wilt thou then not be afraid of that power or authority? Here's what the Christian does. You do that which is good, and thou shalt have praise of the same. That's a principle we see. For he... That authority, that power is the minister of God to thee for good. But if thou do that which is evil, then you should be afraid. For he beareth not the sword in vain, for he is the minister of God, a revenger to execute wrath upon him that doeth evil. Wherefore, you must needs be subject, not only for wrath, but also for conscience sake. For, for this cause... Pay ye tribute also, for they are God's ministers, attending continually upon this very thing. Render, therefore, to all their dues, tribute to whom tribute is due, custom to whom custom, fear to whom fear, and honor to whom honor. So Paul, the apostle, says God has ordained the powers or authorities that are over us, and we are to honor their place before God and before man. And he makes clear to us it's a spiritual issue. It's not only for wrath's sake, but it is for conscience sake. So in a place where there were no Christian governments, no Christian ruling authorities, all were pagan, global, regional, local, they were typically unfriendly and even hostile to the church, to Christ, to Christians. Testimony here is submission to these authorities is not incompatible with submitting to the Lordship of Christ. It actually is submitting to the Lordship of Christ. So the commands of Romans 13 are universal and timeless in application. God put those authorities in place, verse 1. The authorities that be are established by God, verse 1. To rebel against authority is to rebel against God, verse 2. Teaching us that the state is a divine institution with divine authority. And that Paul is warning Christians against rebelling against the state. And we understand from the scriptures that in Acts chapter 5, there was a statement in verse 29, when they were told not to preach the gospel. I want you to be quiet about this one. Hear me with this Christ up. They say, you know what? We have to obey God rather than man. The, um, the midwives were told to kill the babies. Can't do that. Those things that are against God. Bow to an image. Daniel. Stop praying to God. Stop preaching Christ. In those situations, we understand that submission to God is the testimony there. But you know what? Submission to God in every one of those cases was not the same as defying the government. To say I'm going to submit to God rather than man 
is not a statement of defiance against government. From the tone of the scripture from Jesus forward, defying government is not a Christian posture anytime. And so as we in this life are responsible to be Christ-like as citizens, we have to remember that the state, according to verse 4 of our text, is God's servant to do good. Verse 4, God's servant to bring punishment. Verse 6, God's servant. So what is needed from us is a Christ-likeness of spirit to say, okay, I've seen Christ in two of those situations. And to be very, very careful and very cautious and very aware of our own spirit as we deal with the issue of seeking to be the people that Christ saved us to be. First Timothy chapter 2. First Timothy chapter 2. This is one that challenges me because I am not as faithful as I should be in doing what Timothy is told by Paul as a young pastor that he is to do. So I read this with you and take into consideration the recognition that there needs to be adjustments in my life to reflect aright this teaching of Paul. He says this in 1 Timothy 2, verse number 1, I exhort therefore that first of all, supplications, prayers, intercessions. So supplication is a recognition of need. A prayer is an approach to God. Um, intercession is a petition. And notice this one, giving of thanks. So that would be gratitude rather than complaint. Be made for all men. Specifically, he says, for kings and for all that are in authority. That we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior. And listen to where Paul's heart is, what his concern is, who will have all men to be saved and to come into the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time, wherein too, he says, I am ordained a preacher and apostle. I speak the truth in Christ and lie not, a teacher of the Gentiles in faith and verity or truthfulness. I will therefore that men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting. So at the end of the day, when you get kind of a broad spectrum of Christian ideas regarding Christian citizenship, I think when you back all the way down and say, if we just take this one text and ask the question, is this what I'm doing? Am I in supplication and prayer and intercession and giving of thanks? for kings, for all that are in authority. Is, is that, does that characterize me? Not complaint, but gratitude. Not criticism, but prayer. So there is a testimony here that we have to wrestle with. Um, as believers, as quote unquote American Christians, the Bible doesn't really specify what if you're an American Christian? <laughs> what if you got rights? It doesn't say that. It just says this is what you're supposed to do. First Peter chapter two. One more. So we can all check our own hearts. We can all look at this and say, okay, um, is, this, is this what I do? Is this the pattern of my life? There should be respect, Romans 13. There should be prayer, 1 Timothy 2. And then we have really issues of conduct 
in 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse number 11, please. Verse 11, dearly beloved, I beseech you as strangers and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lust, which war against the soul, having your conversation honest among the Gentiles, that whereas they speak against you as evildoers, they may, by your good works, look at the contrast here, which they shall behold, glorify God in the day of visitation. Notice again, when Peter talks about this, he's concerned about souls. He's concerned about the testimony of Christ's people. So live this way. And then he moves from there in verse 13 to this, submit yourselves to every ordinance of man. Why? For the Lord's sake, whether it be to the king as supreme or unto governors as unto them that are sent by him for the punishment of evildoers and for the praise of them that do well. Look at verse 15. For so is the will of God. That with well-doing, you may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men. As free, but not using your liberty as a cloak of maliciousness, but as the servants of God. Honor all men, love the brotherhood, fear God, and honor the king. Now, I've had conversations I've had to walk away from with other pastors. I understand that this sounds... Like, wow, that just, you know, you mean we can't make cross comments about those who are over us? We can't criticize them. We can't make fun of them. We can't rant and rant. Not according to the Bible, you can't. Well, I don't like what they're doing. Okay, then pray for them. Intercede for them. Beseech God in regards to their souls. And recognize that that indeed is their greatest need. So Christian citizenship, three reminders, three reference points for us. God is ruler over all. Jesus is the perfect image bearer. So we have that testimony. And the apostles give us the Lord's mind. I think we have to be honest with God's word. We have to be honest with our human tendencies. Some of us were taught these things and are grateful for that. Some of us weren't and need to make adjustments that way. Honesty with God's word, our natural man tendencies, the tendency to, to create qualifiers or to, to, to stretch on these things. We need to recognize the Lordship of Jesus Christ and our trust in him in all things. And we express our faith by doing the things that God tells us to do. And when those things are tested, we express our faith by doing the things that God told us to do. When Nero's in charge, we do the things that God told us to do. And so our endeavor and our desire would be to be Christ-like as citizens, to be a testimony of his grace and mercy in our lives to make sure that we have not slidden into more of a patriotic national approach and view to things than we have a biblical view of things. To be honest with God's word, to be honest about our natural tendencies, to recognize the Lordship of Christ and trust him, trust him in all things. Let's pray together. Father, we are grateful that you have blessed us with another beautiful day, that you have granted us the opportunity to run the race with these people. That, Father, you have spoken to things that uh, you knew that we needed answers to, that the people in Paul's day and Peter's day and Christ's day needed answers to. And we suspect that our minds are a bit cluttered with a brand of Christianity that we have grown up with that seems acceptable and yet to come to these texts and sit under the weight of them, for me, causes me a bit of conviction, uh, brings me to a resolution in regards to my own spirit, my own prayer, 
I do thank you that uh, a number of us do have a heritage of being, res uh, being taught respect and honor. Uh, those of us who would never think of having smart words to say back to some officer that uh, is serving his role under your uh, providential care of us. And I thank you for that. And I don't want to take that for granted. But Father, there's this issue of praying and interceding and beseeching you in regards to their souls that there's probably none of us that are as faithful with this as we should be. So we ask that we take these things to heart. We ask that we would stand solidly with the perfect image bearer, the Lord Jesus Christ, that we would hear his simple and straightforward answers. We'd not build qualifiers in. We'd not do a run around and reason around the truth, but that we just deal with the issues of our own heart and keep moving forward. We pray that there would be unity among uh, your people as your church, that this world would have a consistent testimony. And Father, we would know, we'd be wise to know uh, when there's been a violation of something that you have called us to and told us to do, and that we would stand squarely with you in those cases. We thank you for our time. We thank you for the fellowship we'll enjoy, the food we'll enjoy later this evening. Minister grace to the needs of your people and help us to be aware of each other as we uh, seek to move forward together. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. You are dismissed.